Thank you for taking the time to watch this rebroadcast of an interview with Life's Journey founder, Chris Shea. For more information about Life's Journey, check out our website at www.lifesjourneyblog.com. We hope you enjoyed the interview. Good morning, everyone. We're happy to have you. We'll be talking about ensuring habits for the whole year. I don't know if uh, by now people have probably already broken some of their New Year's resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> And some may not have started them yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, have you? Did you make any, and did you break any by now? Personally, I haven't made any yet, so I'm not at the point where I can say that I have broken any yet. <laughs> well, that's that's handy. <laughs> <laughs> How about yourself? Well, what I've, what I've kind of done is instead of making like resolutions in, in the past, I, I've done things like, okay, I'm going to lose 20 pounds and, um, and made really sort of concrete ones that are, uh, that once I break them, I feel terrible. I've done more sort of general ones. And, um, and then this year, I didn't even call them resolutions. I sort of made like commitments to different ways of thinking, more sort of philosophical ones. I don't know if that's just my way of weaseling out of them or <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't think it had anything to do in a way with the new year in, in a regular sense. But, um, uh, but maybe before we get started, maybe we should a little bit announce who we are, because I always sure. feel like maybe we're strangers to some of the people watching and I'd hate to be sort of uh, un hostessy. So, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good plan. So, yes, for anybody watching, just a quick, by way of quick introduction, uh, my name is Lisa DeLay, and I do a podcast called Spark My Muse. It's at iTunes, Spreaker, uh, Stitcher, and Google Play. And you can also listen at sparkmymuse.com. And I invite you to do that. Uh, absolutely. Not right now, but soon. <laughs> and Chris also does a podcast now, too. Yes, and uh, I'm Chris Shea, and I uh, also do a podcast, and it's called uh, On Finding Peace. And you can find that podcast over at iTunes and Stitcher and Spreaker and TuneIn and I guess almost anywhere you can get the RSS feed. Uh, so... You know, invite people to go there and search for that. And also, I have a uh, blog, and uh, I'm also a counselor. And uh, my website is uh, lifesjourneyblog.com. So go on over there, and you can kind of see a bit more about me. Yeah, one of the neat things, Chris and I both found Blab, too. And I think we both have been drawn to this platform as a way to sort of augment what we already do. And, and sort of enhance what, what we already do. It's kind of a nice way to add a live element, to have discussions, and I think it adds a lot to what we're doing. I, I know for me, I love, I'm a very curious person and I will wind up reading a book and then trying to contact the author and trying to <laughs> delve in more. But the nice thing about this format and having a co-host and uh, asking the audience and uh, maybe inviting guests sometimes is that it's a whole different vibe than doing a pre-recorded thing. And, and the thing that Chris and I are also trying to do is add these audios to our podcast too on a mm -hmm. And I wind up archiving them at my website, but, and Chris also puts them on his podcast. So they're, it's not just uh, it's nice to have them live, but it's also nice to have them to just refer back to as well. Exactly, and and that's one of the reasons I've been placing them over on the podcast because not everyone knows about uh, Blab, and you know as much as I have that on the website, you know I think it's just more places that people can go and find us, and 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 I would agree. I, I appreciate what we're doing because I do appreciate the back and forth and and having people you know, joining us and talking. Uh, you know, I put a few. You know, uh, just started podcasting and have a few there, and it's just me talking, and and uh, it's just not as much fun as uh, you know, having a co-host and having others join in. So, I, you know, I definitely encourage 
uh, you know, people to log in and chat with us. And if you don't want to get on the video, then, you know, type in some comments and uh, it'll be uh, great for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we were going to be talking a little bit about how could we can have habits and keep them all year. And if you have, if you wanted to talk about how you've been able to keep your habits, I don't know if we have somebody coming in now to talk about habits. And, and if we could stay on topic with that, that, that would also be good, too. Sometimes we have people pop in and they don't stay on topic. So if you wind up not staying on topic, we might pop you back out. Not, not to be rude, but we'll just we'll have to do that. Uh, or we'll call it a technical difficulty and oops, they're gone. <laughs> no so I don't know. Maybe we have some trouble here. Someone's popping in and out. So um, and there's uh, Blab is still in beta. So sometimes there are glitches and I see someone's been popping in and out and I can't, yeah. I can't get them up. But um so uh, one of the things I wanted to commit to this year, I'm not calling it a resolution, but I have <clears throat> committed to um, being more useful. And that includes uh, in general being more useful on my podcast, but being more useful just in my life and thinking of myself as a person that is going to try to routinely be useful to other people. And I, I I think in general, I'm not an unuseful person, but thinking of my life in, in those terms, I don't know that I've actually sort of set out to do that on a daily or weekly basis. And so that's actually sort of an unusual, you could call it a resolution, but it, it's sort of just a philosophical shift, I guess you could say. And so that's actually one of them. And um, being generous, which is a, a, also sort of a, philosophical commitment, I guess you could say it was another one. <laughs> um, and uh, those are those are two of them that I kind of made a commitment to. Of course, the general one is a sort of a recommitment to just try to be healthy and exercise and, and those mm -hmm. types of things. But I don't actually set like pound goals, you know, anymore, because I just feel like um, once my clothes feel too tight, that's what I try to just avoid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't just, I don't like set pound goals anymore because if I, if I fail at them, then I, I really kind of like lost twice in a way. So I don't know. How, how have you, what do you think you'll wind up setting for yourself if you, if you set anything? Well, for me, when I look at the resolutions, it's more, I guess, the philosophical, like what you were talking about, that you know, how can I try to be the best person that I can be? How can I try to help others? You know, that can I do more self-examination? So for me, a lot of things when I look at resolutions, I, I just look at it as a furthering of myself in that sense, you know, and, and I, I've never really written lists mm. of, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Uh, even though I, I did write a uh, blog post on how to write effective lists, <laughs> I myself don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was like well, Shane out of my all. So <laughs> effective, non-effective, just don't do them. Uh, but um, one of those reasons, you know, that, that I don't is it, it does go back to that, for me, to the mindfulness of, of staying in that moment and, Sometimes I think when we do the resolution, are we focused too much on that future me and miss the current me? Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and that's not to say, you know, don't make plans for the future, you know, don't try to be, you know, better. But, you know, I, I kind of like what you're saying in the sense of, you know, instead of putting on this pound issue, uh, you know, for yourself, it, it's you know, kind of you're staying in that moment, you know, so the clothes don't fit. Well, okay, I got to do something about it. You know, you, you're living in the moment for yourself mm -hmm. versus I, I have to have a certain number. Right. You know, and I think part of that problem comes in, then do we set ourselves up for failure? Right. You know, because what if you don't reach that exact pound number? Right. Yeah. Versus, you know, like for you, you know, well, if the clothes don't fit, well, I'm going to do something about it. That, that's a little looser. That gives you some leeway, you know, for the goal is, well, the clothes just going to fit better. Right. There's more leeway than a, a total failure. 
Yeah. And the other thing about it is just simplicity. And one of the things about keeping habits and making them stick is making it really, really simple because you know, you could, you can step on a scale and then you'd be like, well, I have my shoes on. Okay. I'll take my shoes off. Well, this is a really big bulky sweater. So maybe that, you know, you can wind up getting it so complicated, but if you, Mm -hmm. if you think about it in, in just simplicity's sake, well, this is my, this is how I'm going to exercise. So this is how I do it. I'm going to move more. So I'm going to, I'm going to move that. That's essentially it. So like it, I'm going to, I'm going to move more than I was a month ago. So in in a typical day, you know, I wasn't really moving a lot. So that means um, not a lot of things, but I'm going to try to take a walk today. And the the walk is going to tend to be 20 to 30 minutes. I'm not going to set these impossible, complicated goals like, well, I'm going to run a 5k. So that means I'm going to have to do, because I know that I'm not going to do that. I know right. that I'm going to set this big, complicated goal and it's not going to happen. But I know if the goal is I'm going to move more, I know that's actually going to happen. I've actually heard this this tactic and it sounds so ridiculous. But if you do it, it works. The It's this um, someone said about uh, how they started flossing their teeth and what they decided to do was set this impossibly low or this ridiculously low goal of I will floss one tooth. Does that sound ridiculous? But what happens is if you set a goal of say, I'm not going to floss my teeth, I'm going to floss. My goal is to floss one tooth. Mm-hmm. You will do it because you'll mm-hmm. say, well, of course I'll, I can do that. You know, but then right. if you floss one, you'll floss them all, you know, so uh, at least the fun too. <laughs> just the one. <clears throat> but it's, it's a weird thing that you, you say, because you won't really fail. You'll, you'll think, Hey, I, I did the one. And so mm-hmm. you can't, possibly fail so you set your goal so simple that it that you can have a lot of wins and when you have it's a snowball of wins and so i think that like there's a lot of like little psychological tricks like that and i don't know if you in your in your uh, um counseling addicts and things like that if you ever have those chances to set up those psychological wins and what that looks like yeah, and what do they look like? Exactly what you just talked about. <laughs> that you know, because it, it it seems daunting to expect somebody to come to their end goal day one. Yeah. So if, if somebody is you know coming to me for help, if I were to say to them, "All right, well, floss all your teeth by tomorrow," this is you know how you can do it. I, I, if it were that easy, why are they talking to me? Yeah. You know, they can go floss all their teeth. I mean, the point is, they, they, for whatever reason, there's that block. So, you know, one, we have to discover what is the block. What's getting in the way? Why aren't you, say, flossing your teeth? You know, what's, what's happening there? Uh, but as you had said, if we set smaller goals, because if I were to say to myself, well, I can't floss my teeth because if I do that, then... Uh, you know, like takes too much time or it's too intensive or whatever. Yeah. But you're right. If, if I say, well, then don't but do your front two ones. That's what most people are going to see anyways. So just do that. <laughs> you know, it's like, like you said, well, sure, I'll, I can do that. And, and, you know, I think over time, once they see, hey, this is possible, this is doable, mm-hmm. you know, that is really where you get someone because that's where you start having them find that self-confidence that, yeah, you can do it. Mm-hmm. You know, so when I work with people uh, suffering with addictions, you know, definitely the way to work on it as to, you know, the, the saying from Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and all, you know, one day at a time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, it's not just a cute saying. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in a lot of ways it, it's mindfulness, uh, but not using that word. But, when I would have people suffering with, with the addiction and the cravings and for them to imagine the rest of my life, I'm never going to have a drink again. Right. It's like daunting, you know, and when I dealt with people in their early twenties, you know, assuming they have a long life, they're so like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Especially if they've had it so often and that's how they got through every social mm-hmm. situation or every meet business meeting or date or something and thinking I'll never be able to have, I'll never be able to go to another party. I'll never be able to 
Right. You know, I, I can't forever and ever and like my entire <laughs> life, like that could be, you know, like 60 years, <laughs> you know, right, right. but you know, when you refocus that and say, well, no, I'm not telling you, you can never, ever, ever have a drink again the rest of your life. Right. I'm just telling you don't have a drink today. Right. And when you wake up tomorrow, tell yourself, I'm not going to have a drink tomorrow when you wake up, but definitely today don't have a drink. Right. And tomorrow morning, just tell yourself the same thing. You know, because before you know it, you've already got a couple of years under your belt of saying, hey, I'm not drinking today, tomorrow, that's my goal too. You know, right. So that becomes manageable. And, and if you get some time under your belt, you know, you, you get X amount of months or maybe, you know, a couple of years, right. then you might be able to say, well, you know, if I've done it a couple of years, I mean, could it be doable? Mm -hmm. You know, so if I've done it for two years, I guess I could do two more. So hopefully, yeah, take it slow. You'll get, give yourself a break. Uh, but if we just keep that focus on the moment, uh, you know, we can do almost anything just for this moment. Right, right. Yeah, and I guess if you can't, if you're, if, even if you're thinking ahead into the evening, like if you're, if you're thinking, well, you know, I don't know about tonight, but I know about right now. I won't have right. one right now. But, you know, you're thinking ahead. If, you're, if you are thinking past your moment right now, you're, you're not totally sure that you can handle no. it. But if you're thinking right now, okay, right now I can control this moment and mm -hmm. right now I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and, and I don't know about, I don't know about two hours from now and I don't know about tonight and I don't know about that mm -hmm. morning, but right now the answer is no. And, right. and creating new habits, you know, to have your presence of mind in the present moment is doable. And you can't take on that anxiety of the future mm -hmm. right now. Well, and the other point, you know, in, in sticking with that, if somebody says, well, how am I supposed to do that? A few ways of doing it, is, is, and I think one of the best ways would be distract yourself. Mm. Or get somebody else to distract you. Mm. I, I remember sometimes patients would call me up after they've left treatment, and I, I used to work in inpatient treatment, so... You know, they'd be with us for a month or so, and then they would leave. And mm. they were always telling them, you know, go to your meetings, get your sponsor, you know, work a program. And there were times I had patients call me back and say, this sponsor thing isn't working. And like, I really wanted to have a drink or take that drug. I called my sponsor and said, hey, I really want to have a drink. And my sponsor asked me if I saw the game last night. And he spent like 20 minutes talking to me about the stupid baseball game. I didn't care about the baseball game. I wanted him to tell me not to drink. Oh, yeah. Well, you get the thing, because then I would say to them, well, did you have that drink? They said, no, I was like so upset that he wouldn't listen to me. It's like, isn't that the point? Yeah. You know, the more you want to dwell on the fact, you know, of thinking of, you know, this craving and, and giving this craving, you know, like time to fester, you know, and just keep focusing and focusing and focusing, I tell you, you're going to cave into it. Yeah, right. But all that sponsor is trying to do is say, stop thinking about the craving. Let's talk about something else. Because behaviorally, there's studies that show after about 15, 20 minutes, a craving is going to go away. Yeah. So yeah. divert the attention long enough that now the craving doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if there's ways to change your environment or to you know, divert yourself or do whatever you need to do, uh, or a good 15, maybe half an hour, you should be good. Yeah, I guess that has a lot to do, like you could say the same thing for ha habits of overeating too. Like any any um, habits that have to do with delayed gratification, overspending, overeating, any substances, mm -hmm. like anything that has to do with um, too, much, too much of something, you know, overspending, uh, or buying like a uh, habitually buying or, you know, clicking, mm -hmm. clicking the buy button on eBay or whatever. <laughs> right? So it's yeah. like, it's like the postponing, like I'm going to, I'm going to hit the pause button on this or waiting something out is, is all those things that have to be, um, will, it will help you to distract and put in a surrogate so that your mm -hmm. mind has something else to do while that craving and that longing 
dissipate, but it does dissipate. Right. And I think that that's what's, mm -hmm. that's what's so interesting about craving because it feels really hot. Like, I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense, but anybody who's felt like that hot, um, I mean, I don't, I mean, thank God I never tried uh, cocaine or, you know, any of those drugs because mm -hmm. I know the feeling of like that, I have to have it, you know, um, and, and that that feels very hot and intense. Yep. You do have to wait it out and then it does go away and it kind of wanes. Yep. But in that moment, it doesn't feel like anything else exists, but that craving and that, that mm -hmm. it's like a stove on, you know. Yep. And, so, uh, and, the, and the more you give that cravings to it, the more that it, it's, it's going to get worse. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you have a headache or, or another physical pain in your body, the more you focus on that and emphasize that within yourself, it gets worse. Mm. But, you know, same thing, if you try to distract yourself, you know, it doesn't necessarily make the headache go away. But what it may do is lessen the pain of that headache because you're no longer focused on that pain. Mm. So anything that we actually spend time focusing on it is going to be stronger. Uh, so, you know, that, that's just something to refocus what one's attention, you know, but I think it can work in the other way too, you know, so let's say somebody has a resolution that, you know, I'm going to go to the gym more often. Well, even that nagging that might say, oh, just sit and watch TV tonight or, you know, just, uh, you know, don't do it or whatever negative thoughts you have going through your mind that's trying to keep you from the gym. Right. I think in a very similar way if we were to refocus so it's not so much that craving but it's more the that negative notion or, or you know whatever it is keeping me if i can refocus my mind i can get rid of that mm. negative thought and end up going to the gym mm. mm -hmm. i know for stuff like exercise i totally need a buddy system and i that's what i did today so a friend of mine said um, we put a little, we put some workout stuff in, in our one room. Do you want to come over? And I knew that if she asked me that I would go, but like on my right. own, it, it is really hard. Like for, so for some, for some habits, like for instance, exercise, I kind of need a buddy system and I need a social pressure. And I know for, yeah. for certain habits, it's super important and knowing which habits need which kind of reinforcement is really important. <laughs> so for some, yeah. for some habits, it's the distraction and it's the, let me occupy my mind with something else. So I don't do something like overeat or overspend for some habits. It's the total social, social pressure stuff. I mean, I mean, it might be a combination of some too. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why, um, self-help groups, work mm -hmm. yeah. because you use other people to help motivate or demotivate you know depending on what it is that you're doing if demotivate is a word but you know it, you've got other people who want to understand you and, and two can help you through whatever you're going through because they've probably been there done that right so the other reason that the self-help groups work is we are social beings Right. And in being social beings, for most of us, any grouping that we're in, and if you think about it, you know, when you go from home to work, to school, whatever it may be, we tend to mimic the mm. environment that we're in. Yes, yes. So, you know, if I'm having these deep cravings and I go to a self-help group, I start to mimic that group just because that's what we do as social creatures. Yeah. You know, in most cases, that's why there's order in our society. You know, we, we you know, go to the mall or go to theaters or, or wherever and, and you watch what everyone else is doing and you do similarly. Yeah. You know, so you just need a few to follow the rules and most of us are just going to keep along with those people who are following the rules. Yeah, even if you aren't realizing that you're adopting the social norms, you, you are. So, you know, I think um, sometimes we're trying to adopt the social norms and sometimes we're just adopting them mindlessly 
just in order to fit in just because that's the social pressure and we're social creatures and we do adapt you know so like, <laughs> whether you're whether you're trying to or not you do adapt you know if everybody in the if everybody in your in your peer group is smoking you'll probably start smoking or if everybody you know so i, I think you're right it depends on who you're surrounding yourself with and mm -hmm. um i know that um well, i do prison ministry once a week and there's a guy who who started coming and he decided to stop to to start coming to the group he decided to change his name to his birth name because he had always gone by some slang street name mm -hmm. he decided when he started coming he was going to have perfect attendance and he was going to no longer go by the name he's gone by for probably 20 years and people didn't even know what his regular name was and it's that identity change and complete change of his um social circle that was going to keep him thinking different thoughts and mm -hmm. going on a new path and changing his circle and changing his his language choices and changing his thought choices and so it is it is different you know the choice of friends that he was going to have was going to put him in a different frame of mind to think on different things and make different mm -hmm. choices and so it, it really it really does change your habits like the yep. choices you make the, the people you're surrounding yourself with it really is true well, yeah, that, that definitely works. And, you know, throughout my career of working with people with addictions and working inpatient, you know, facilities, one of the, the joys that I had in working in inpatient is in seeing them every day, I really saw how they progressed. Mm. And the more they were in and the more they were doing, as the example that you gave, you could really see a physical change in them. Wow. And that physical change helped their psychological change, their spiritual change. Because for a lot of us, too, you know, if, if we don't like who we are, or like the way we look or, you know, whatever it is, the more we see ourselves in that way, it reinforces to ourselves, see, you know, I'm overweight or I'm underweight or, you know, the, look what the drugs are doing to me, look what the alcohol is doing to me. Once they started looking healthier just because they weren't using Hmm. Well, that shows something too. So when they see themselves, you know, there's one morning and then happen to notice, like, wait a minute, I look better. <laughs> but what's it going to say to the inside, you know, that, yeah, you, you're looking better, so now I'm starting to feel better. If I feel better, I'm going to start doing more actions hmm. to continue to feel better. Yeah. And, and it can become a snowball effect just by shifting how I perceive, how I'm looking when I see myself in the mirror. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was um, thinking about uh, some of the things that keep me on track as far as goals and habits and things like that too. And one of the things that I try to do every day, and I haven't been so good at doing it like a weekly thing, but mm -hmm. um, I had somebody on my podcast back in the summer in the in September, I think Kyle Reed, if anybody's interested in going, to sparkmymuse.com for this resource. It's a free resource that he has. If you search Kyle Reed at sparkmymuse.com, you'll come up with it and you can download it for free. And he has um, a daily like resource and a weekly one. And you can <clears throat> write down your tasks for the week and, and see it all laid out in front of you. And it's actually, it's highly productive once you actually get it out there. So it takes like 10 or 15 minutes on a Monday to fill it out and kind of what, how you see your week kind of laid out and what your main priorities and main goals are. And once you lay it out, you know, I noticed when the couple weeks I did it, like 15 minutes to do, but it might've saved me two or three hours then in my week of just organizing and fussing with things and moving back and forth between tasks. Mm -hmm. and it was already laid out ahead of time. And so I've been, the way I wind up trying to get things done and accomplishing things is setting out my main three or four things ahead of time the night before and accomplishing right. them. And then those are the, ha those are like the habits that I want to keep the next day maybe, or just the, the regular productivity goals I want to accomplish the next day. And that's another thing. I, I think that sometimes if we actually get it down on paper, we have, you know, fighting chance that it can happen. Oh, definitely, because it becomes visible. You know, I would always have my clients and patients write things down mm. because it's there. It's in black and white. Mm. Well, and even just on a positive note, we can legitimately forget 
and then remember later, and then you get down on yourself. You know, I should have remembered, or you know, how can I forget this? Or we can fake forget, <laughs> try to convince ourselves that you know we forgot. But you know, if it's in black and white. Not only is it re-imprinted in our minds, the fact that we actually took the time to write it down, mm. but it's there. So you really, if you are forgetting it, go back to your sheet of paper mm. and, and you can see what that is. Mm -hmm. so I like when you say, you know, a couple to three or so, because a lot of the studies uh, say that if you're going to make lists, really shouldn't be much more than three major tasks for a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for somebody who loves lists, you could have like, you know, 10 or more things on a list. Mm -hmm. Realistically, you're never going to finish those unless they're like 10 really, really simple things. But mm -hmm. if they're not, you're not going to finish them. If you don't finish them, mm -hmm. that again is going to make you feel down on yourself. And, and the more you feel down on yourself, you're, you, you become less apt to even try. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what happens with some of the resolutions, you know, so if I'm going to go to the gym, say three, three or so times a week, and I miss a week because of whatever, mm -hmm. then you get down on yourself and then it, it becomes even harder to go back because you've already kind of convinced yourself that it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you, if you keep the goals or the lists reasonable, if you can finish three things every single day and every single day you're, you're, accomplishing what you set out to do, again, you're, you're going to be very proud of yourself, very accomplished, and that's going to give you the energy to try maybe some other things. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed, too, um, habits like, um, I don't actually take vitamins, but I noticed that if you tie a habit to something that's already a habit, it makes a huge difference huge difference and so um habits of like uh, taking a medication tying it to a mm -hmm. habit that you already do like brushing your teeth it makes it it really really ensures that it'll happen because it's already tied to something that's completely ingrained already and exactly. so um i noticed that it really can just it, it piggybacks it piggybacks onto the other habit <clears throat> so you know i wouldn't i would never go a day without brushing my teeth in the morning and the night i would it would be really, really strange if I didn't do that. I'd, I'd feel like, no, my teeth, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know that tying my, you know, tying a medicine, medication taking to that would automatically mean that I would take it because right. it's so, it's so ingrained to brush my teeth. And so it's easy to do that. And if, it, if I tie that to something else, like a devotional practice or something um, I'm going to do with my kids, that's a regular you know, interaction with them. And it's mm -hmm. also tied to that same thing. I'm going to do this immediately before, immediately after. It right. makes a big difference. The, the thing is, is not uh, having such a long bunch of rituals and routines that it's too impossible to carry it out. But I think that having some of that built in already, it's, it's already mm -hmm. built in structure, that it makes it a little easier to keep some habits going throughout the whole year. Right. Do you have no. anything like that that works like that for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of what I do, I tie in two days of the week so that I know, you know, what is my routine on a Monday? And, you know, that's going to be a little bit different on a Tuesday because, you know, maybe Monday my you know, maybe it's the flossing day and, you know, Tuesday's not or, you know. But if I keep each day set to what it is I'm going to do, it's it's – easier to remember mm -hmm. and over time the routine is going to become the norm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know when i was working with the addictions the inpatient treatment was always 20 to 30 days and you know people are sometimes wondering you know, well what's this magic number why is it 28 to 30 days well because behavioral studies show if we do a new behavior regularly mm -hmm pretty much daily, but regularly for about a month, it becomes ingrained mm -hmm. and it becomes something we look forward to. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a routine, because it, if you change it up all the time, you know, some people say, well, that, you know, I'm being more flexible this way. I'm, you know, well, sure, you can be spontaneous and there's room for that, but regular things, if you can do it on a set routine, your body is going to get used to that. 
and then it, you almost don't have to think about it. You just know today is Monday and this is what I do, or you know something else is this and this is what I do. Mm-hmm. The more you change it, the less it's going to become ingrained and the more that you have the likelihood of eventually it slips away. Yeah. And then you just figure, well, it wasn't important then. Because you know, we like to convince ourselves, you know, so if, if I couldn't do that certain resolution, well, I, I guess it wasn't meant to be anyways. Yeah, and also you don't have to think about it anymore. Uh, allowing yourself to not have to consciously think, uh, make a choice anymore, take the choice off the table. Like, should mm-hmm. I or shouldn't I do this? And um, you're kind of relieving yourself of the mental ram that it takes to to choose whether you're going to make the decision or not. Should I Should I do this? Should I do this thing I kind of don't want to do? You've already made the decision. You've already incorporated it in. Mm-hmm. You're kind of eliminating the choice. And once you eliminate the choice and you're ju- you just have the discipline built in, um, you don't even have to think about it again. So you could just right. decision's done. <laughs> I, I made it well, yeah. And the more we can make whatever it may be, the more we can make it more normal, it's going to be easier to do. Yeah. You know, because it's always that thing that seems so extraordinary that we can convince ourselves there's no way, you know, you know, I mean, say, I, I know you said you, you wouldn't train for the 5K and believe me, I don't run. <laughs> but let's say somebody says, you know, I'm, I'm you know, going to run, you know, every other day before I go to work. Well, that's probably not something that you're going to relish that next morning. <laughs> but if it's something you know is doable, and you fight through that urge that says, hit the snooze, don't do this, you don't need it. If you can do that for a month or so regularly, so if it's every say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, make sure for a month you do every Monday, Wednesday, Friday without breaking it. Mm-hmm. By the end of that month, it's going to become almost the routine. And if you try to break it on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, you're actually not going to feel as good. Mm-hmm. because it's already become that kind of norm. And if it's a norm, well, it's something I just do. Right. So it's not difficult anymore because I just do it. Mm. But you have to fight through those beginnings to make it that norm, yeah. which is also why you don't want to do something you know you can't do. Because if you can't make it a norm in your life, it, it, it's really not going to work. Mm. It has to make sense to you. Or else why would you do it? Yeah, you won't. There's no motivation to keep it up if if it seems if it's too outlandish. And, right. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there's anybody when it when it says eleven and it says two. I can't tell if that means uh, eleven people can kind of hear what we're doing. Oh, or three, <laughs> um, <laughs> and how many people can actually participate? But if anybody out there would like to talk about how they've kept habits and would like to either type something in or pop in and talk about it. We're totally, um, definitely totally would love to hear from you about how you've kept a habit or, um, what has helped you keep habits and kept, keep, kept them for a long time or kept a new year's resolution. Or if you have a question about a habit you'd love to keep and how you might do it. And you have a question, you can type it in uh, or ask and we'll Mm -hmm. try to take a crack at it uh, because we're, uh, we'd love to get more people participating, but I can't tell when it says 11 and three, if that just means there's some people I know that will not be able to participate because of whatever platform right. they're on. So some of that is that. But. Yeah. I believe the 11 is probably the amount of people listening or watching, mm-hmm. but who came in anonymously or, mm-hmm. you know, like you say, a different platform. Yeah not totally subscribed or something like that. Right. So yeah. could be on anonymously and hearing us, but choose not to participate. Yeah. And and the other thing too I wanted to mention is we're going we're doing this about um twice a month and the other let's see if I can I'm not sure if I can paste this in or not, but this I'm gonna paste in the link to the next one we're gonna do, which mm-hmm. is January twenty eighth. And I'm gonna be hosting that one at the link that I just pasted up there. You can also find it at blab.im forward slash Lisa Delay, which is my name. And that's gonna be on how and when to do a U turn in your life where Chris and I will be host co hosting again. So we're gonna try to do this on Thursdays like about twice a month mm-hmm. at eight o'clock and do a regular thing because we have a lot of fun together. And we usually have just a lot of people 
coming in and it's a little less than normal today. I'm not sure why. Maybe the uh, freezing, well, maybe people are hunkered down in their blankets. And, <laughs> I don't know. That's the best time to tune in. <laughs> Yeah, 8 o'clock. And then we might at 9, sometimes close to 9, all of a sudden a bunch of people will pour on. I don't know if 9 is like the sweet spot or something. But, <laughs> but um, We'll have to see what happens today and talk about it then. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then um, we thought be, at the beginning of the year, we do tend to kind of reevaluate how the how the year has gone, how the previous year has gone, and how we want it to change. And we do tend to set new habits for ourselves or maybe set out on a new course in the new year. I know I have tended to do that too. And I wound up, sometimes I go through my phone even, and I look at all the old pictures, or maybe I go on Facebook and look at all my old posts from the year to see what have I written, um, like on my blog, what have I written and what have I, um, what have I talked about and what have been major themes in my life and through photos or through uh, my conversations and maybe I'll go through old texts and things like that of how have I been communicating and who have I been communicating to and then what kind of new course do I want to set and new goals, not just goals in terms of like um, topics and themes, although that might come up too, but kind of what sort of what sort of improvements do I want to see in my life and in my relationships and mm -hmm. um, I, you, I'm sure you do that same sort of thing too Chris yeah and I, I've been doing something similar really even I, I think back to like as a kid uh, you know, I can remember being young and you know, it comes New Year's Eve and you, know, you stay up and the ball or the apple or whatever it is, you know, drops. And then even as a kid, you know, going to bed and I remember my routine that night as I'm laying in bed is to kind of go through each month of that previous year and try to think what happened each month. Um, and it's something that, you know, I still try to do. Uh, not in that same way, um, even with all of our electronics um, for many, many years, and I still do this, is have an uh, actual paper calendar. I know it surprises some people what that is. But an actual paper calendar where I ha write um, family and close friends' birthdays. Mm -hmm. So come you know, January 1, you bring out the new calendar, and I take the old calendar, and we have to start transferring you know, the birthdays, but that helps me to recall because, you know, there's usually a birthday or something anniversary each month of the year. Right. So it's like flipping from the old and the new and rewriting. Mm -hmm. You can kind of help to reflect on, you know, what were cause some of the highlights of that month. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and not necessarily always looking for all those negatives, you know, but what was wrong that I got to fix. No, you know, celebrate the pluses as well. And, you know, just kind of look in general, you know, so what was January like in February and mm -hmm. you know, moving on? And uh, so, you know, whatever routine you can come with, I, I would really suggest for people to look at, uh, you know, doing some type of review of the year, yeah. you know, even a cursory review, but just, just reacquaint yourself, it kind of re-imprints it maybe, that, uh, you know, this is kind of what happened to me because who I am today is, you know, partly who I was last year and the experiences I went through, the good and the bad, is, you know, what is making me today. So right. why am I me? <laughs> Let's look at last year. Yeah. Now, have you ever done any kind of journaling or any kind of diary or anything like that, either as a spiritual practice for a time or just by way of <clears throat> what, what wound up happening to me, just just as a brief aside, is I was a journaler diary type person for ages and I had stacks of them. Mm -hmm. And I think blogging actually kind of took that away in a, in a sense. <laughs> took away my desire for it because I'd get it out of my system a little bit. And I would also, I would write kind of poetry privately just as my own cathartic thing, mm -hmm. uh, which I wouldn't put on the blog necessarily. And that kind of satisfied some of that for me. But I only once in a while will, will sort of journal as a sort of a spiritual practice. But that's also another review you can do, almost like going through your calendar. You can I'll, I'll put dates obviously on it, and I'll and I'll maybe reflect, or maybe I'll write a prayer down or something mm -hmm. like that. Do you do anything like that, or have you done anything like that? I 
have. Um, and this is probably an area where I need to grow in because everything I'm going to say now is going to sound like an excuse that I would tell my clients. That's an excuse. You can't say that. Um, but, yeah, when uh, in, in my seminary years, that was something that uh, we were really encouraged to do. And I would keep a, a fairly daily journal of, you know, kind of what was I feeling and what was I uh, you know, reflecting on or praying about, and um, especially the, the one year uh, really kept it pretty extensive, mm -hmm. fairly daily. Um, I wish I were doing that again, you know, and, the, and I think leaving that environment partly stopped it. Uh, right. Getting into just daily life partly stopped it. Right. Um, I agree. Once I started the blogging, well, that's my excuse now. We'll say I'm blogging, so you know I don't need to be doing daily. You know, but but the blogging, even though if I'm putting my own stuff, is not the same as writing my own journal. <laughs> you know, because hopefully what I'm putting in the journal is probably different than what I'm blogging in, in uh, certain aspects. But no, I really would, even though I'm not doing it, I, I really would encourage people because there's been times I've gone back to the journal from the seminary days and you know, you flip through and you read it, it really gives me a perspective of who I was back then and you know what were some of my concerns and what were my struggles and mm -hmm. you know and I think if I were doing it still, uh, it'd probably be quite insightful to, you know, see what have I been struggling with and are they still the same struggles? You know, have I overcome some of the struggles and um, yeah, and I, I would definitely encourage people, even though I'm not doing it <laughs> you know it, there is a difference too of putting a pen to paper than typing on the screen because i've tried it both ways i've tried doing just I, what i felt like is i'll just do um you know open a word document put a date down pound something out because that's better than doing nothing at all true uh, and and i thought that's what i'll do i'll just do this i'll just do it this way for a little bit because i'd like to just get something out and i'd like to have a little bit of a record so i'll just i'll just pound something out because i'm such a fast typist compared to my chicken scrawl that i can't even <laughs> sometimes read um there's a there's a story i've mentioned a couple times that in 10th grade uh forgot to put my name on the paper and the teacher holds up the thing and says now someone didn't put their name on this paper it was obviously a guy <laughs> i was like <laughs> Oh, it's that bad. My aunt is so bad, she thinks some sloppy guy wrote it down. And I was like, um, and then she's like, oh, uh, you don't have to put your name on your paper again. I'll know it's you, Lisa. And I was like, okay, I think that was her way of saying sorry. But um, and, a, a, a little I, gender bias there. I, I, think like, I think that means I'm super creative. I think that's what that means. No, I, I was just like, okay, so I can't, obviously my handwriting's pretty bad and um, always has been. And so it takes a while and I print, I don't really like do cursive. Mm -hmm. and so typing's way, way faster. So I was like, I'll just type. But I've noticed that when I do write and my hand hurts when I do, because I'm so used to typing now, when I do write, I, I write much more much more intimately, much more personally. And, and I, it's much more sort of the, in a sense, the real me. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. When I'm typing, it's fast and it's much more intellectual and it's plenty of good stuff, but it's, it doesn't feel the same as, as a journal for whatever reason. Right. It feels more like a paper because I've done so many papers in seminary and, and whatever research and stuff. And so I think there's a, there's benefits to doing both types. And I would say that mm -hmm. whatever people feel drawn to doing, it's probably worth it to just kind of chronicle your year in whatever feels the best to you, but, but to do it anyway, to, to somehow chronicle your year as a habit is, you know, I would recommend doing mm -hmm. that. And I think anytime I've ever done that, anytime I've ever done any t type of journal or record of my year, I've always liked looking back, even if I didn't like what I was reading and I thought, <laughs> Oh, I was going through a, a dark time or I was, I, I, boy, that was the kids were really having a hard time with this or that. I've still liked going back because it usually showed me the faithfulness of God. And mm -hmm. I, even though I maybe didn't see it at the time, I usually look back and I go, oh, I can see like God's provision and I can see, 
I have compassion on myself. It's a really fascinating thing that happens. I don't even know how to describe it exactly, but I, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's one thing that encourages me now to to be a little more diligent about that. Right, no, and that makes perfect sense because when we can review some of those details especially some of those, you know, like Dark Nights of the Soul or, you know, times that really weren't going well, that if we can see that chronicle, we're seeing kind of the before that happened to the during it to the after. And, and I think that's where we can see, as you're mentioning, you know, how do we notice, you know, God in our lives? Well, look where God was before this happened and yet was still there after it happened. And that without reviewing it probably is something we don't necessarily consider mm. but you could see it because it's definitely there but yeah you, you've got to sit down and, and see it and, and i think that's what you know, makes a lot of the saints writing so important mm. because we can now look back and it's almost like their journals to see that progression and you know maybe see a theme in them that uh, maybe they even missed you know, um, but I also think, you know, it, it's good in, in reviewing because when we're reviewing um, and doing reading, at least if we're reading people who we seem to be drawn toward, mm -hmm. we can maybe gain some comfort that they may have gone through things that we did. Mm -hmm. So... You know, in either hearing podcasts or, you know, reading books or, you know, whatever. And they've gone through some of the things. We go back to our journal and, and look at that and, and think of that. That's very similar, at least around the emotion. Well, maybe I'm not alone. You know, and especially if it's somebody you admire, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, they went through it too. Mm. Must not be that bad then. Well, who do you have in mind? Do you have anybody in mind when you say that? Or is that you just speaking in general terms? Overall, in general terms, but but the person who was coming to my mind was uh, Mother Teresa. Mm, oh, I um, totally agree. I I read some of that. Was it her director who published um, after she passed away? Right, and and there were like volumes of her Dark Night of the Soul, and you know, it, it and it, it really shocked you know tons of people. Yeah. You know that whoa, well, you know Mother Teresa, you know it's like doubting. <laughs> You know, and wasn't feeling God's presence and, you know, what's all this about? But that, one, it gives me comfort because, well, good, you know, I guess I'm not alone. I'm in great company. <laughs> but I think I was, it... I, was, I loved that she did, did the work anyway. I, I, exactly. I was just so inspired. Like, people were like, oh, it was a fraud. She was a fraud. and And I thought... She was a light, even though she was in total darkness. And I, I just mm -hmm. thought, I was just blown away. I couldn't believe it. And, and she just had, she had nothing to go on. And she just yep. still just kept walking in the darkness. And I just was like, I was completely blown away. Yep. Well, and, and, and that's... <laughs> I think that's why it was published at all, because she was like, burn everything. She didn't want people to know that. <laughs> I was like, dang, I'm not going to be a saint, you know. Uh, and, and, but that's, that's why you know, when I think of things like that, and, and it makes me feel good in, in that sense that they're human. You know, and, and right. you can put some of these people on these pedestals and say, well, I could never be a Mother Teresa. Right. But when you read something like that, you can say, well, wait a minute. Yeah, what's stopping me? Because she's like me. But yeah, that that what you just mentioned was the big inspiration for me in, in the sense that even though she wasn't sure sometimes if God was there or what it was all about, it didn't stop her. Right, right. You know, and, and that kind of brings me uh, to one of my favorite uh, quotes from Thomas Merton, um, which I actually just shared because I, I just came off of doing a uh, three-day retreat with a group of uh, 12th graders. And it's one of the things that I shared with them. And, and part of it is, I can paraphrase because I don't have it memorized, but when Merton is writing that, you know, he's not too sure who he is. He's not too sure what God's plan for him is. Mm 
Yeah, you know, know, and there's all these, you know, I don't know this, I don't know that, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'm even pleasing God. Right. But then he ends it by saying, but I do know that if my desire to please God Th that does please bad. God, yeah. then I'm going to keep desiring it even if I'm messing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like keeping that focus, you know, like I, I know nothing when it comes to this. Right. But I'm going to keep on the path anyways. Yeah. And just, you know, believe that God is pleased that at least I'm trying. <laughs> right. That's that's kind of one of the most uh, famous quotes on prayer from Thomas Merton. I, I have it on my website, too, because I was my spiritual director told it to me. And I, I, I was also very inspired by that, too. It's it's mm -hmm. one of those, like, I don't I, I don't really know what I'm doing but I'm desiring to please God, and I know that just that desire is, yep. is enough. And, right. you know, yeah. I, and I, I feel like that pretty much all the time. <laughs> I'm glad other people have it all figured out, though. I mean, what, what seems like around me, everybody, uh, there's a lot of books out there, and everybody knows what they're doing. So I'm really happy for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't really know what I'm doing. But you know, we all thought Mother Teresa had it together. <laughs> and obviously did we? That's pretty that's pretty awesome. So you know, I know and, and, and there's usually like ten steps, it's really cool. But um but I know that it's it's um if the more and the deeper you dig, the more you know that you don't know. Yeah. And so I, I think that that's why keeping it simple in terms of of God and pleasing God and trying to figure it out is probably uh, the wisest and the more the most humble. The, you gotta take the, like the the humble road because you're gonna probably get it wrong. <laughs> like, don't bother getting pretentious because you're gonna just mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that was pretty much the theme of the senior retreat. You know, it was. You know, helping to prepare them you know, when you leave high school and go into like the real world, so to speak. You know, how do you keep a spiritual sense about you? And and part of that theme, the reason I share that, you know, Merton Prayer is, you know, don't think that you're always going to have it together and know exactly where you're called to do or you know, where the path is going. You just have to trust that if you are trying to do the right thing it's going to work out and god is there with you um, but you may not have a clue it, it's not just always laid out for you yeah it, actually if you think you have a clue that's probably um a sign that you do not have a clue I, what is it uh, c.s lewis says that um confidence is a is a sign that you oh man what is it um, <laughs> the, the shirt Confidence is a is a sign that uh, that you don't. Oh no, I'm gonna totally blow it. Um, I, I do the same thing. <laughs> I know where you're going with it. <laughs> oh oh um. Oh, no, I can't I can't think of it now. But you're gonna have to tweet it or something. He's talking about conceit. It was like the person who doesn't think he's conceited is very conceited indeed. It's, it's actually not even a, a, on the same train of thought, but it's, it's a similar kind of thing. It's like the person who's confident is just uh, ignorant of the facts. Is right. essentially it. But um, but it's kind of like the you know the the deeper you drill down into almost any topic, almost like any topic actually, uh, whether it's um, God or, or spirituality or physics or gardening, the, the more you drill down into it, and you'll ask any expert will basically will tell you this too, is that you come into this whole new universe that you didn't realize existed. And, and everybody who's an expert in their field will tell you that they know this little teeny bit about this huge, huge universe of their topic. And yeah, they know that little bit a whole lot. And they're really ignorant about all the other parts, but um, you know. Right, but, but to think that you are, and you know, it kind of reminds me of you know when I was in a, a psych, uh, studying all my psych classes for my uh, counseling. You know, we, we used to say the further along that we got is, is the most dangerous people in the world are the students who finish psych one hundred and one. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Because they think now they know everything there is to know about the human mind and the psychology, you know, and, and we're all there. But I, I did the same thing, you know, it's like, ooh, finish like one one and I can go do counseling now. You know. Yeah. It's not until years later, you know, yeah, years later, you realize, like, man, I was dumb back then. I knew nothing back then. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's it's like, it's, it seems like as far as you can see, but it's only, it's only this deep, mm -hmm. but it's as far as you can possibly see, so it must be everything that you could know, right? Exactly. <laughs> There's nothing past the horizon, you know. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's an easy trap to fall into, and and then um, as, as soon as you as soon as you run into an actual expert, then it, it, it's a quick quickly humbling experience. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's that that'll be um, I guess that that'll be a New Year's a new New Year's resolution perhaps to um, to be humble, <laughs> ensure the habit of. Humbleness, but and, and um, then you can become the most humble person you've ever right. known. Right, yeah, that'll be very quickly broken. Um, <laughs> but we, I, we're pretty much at, toward the end of our hour here. That went very quickly, um, and I hope whoever is, is, I guess we did gain a couple extra people. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sticking with us for this whole time, or for whatever time you, that you came and watched and listened. Uh, we'll be back again on the Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll be doing another, Chris and I will be doing another one. It'll be about U-turns in life, when to do them, how to do them. If you've made a U-turn, I would be happy to hear about it and um, take your wisdom as well. And we'll, we'll also pitch in when we've made U-turns. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been really fun. And we'll, we'll put we'll archive these on our respective uh, platforms. Yep. Chris has his life's journey blog, and I have my sparkmymuse.com. I hope you'll stop by each of those and, and check them out because there's a lot of good resources there. Definitely. Well, yeah, I want to thank everybody. You know, hopefully, if you all like this message, then uh, spread it to all your friends. And uh, another couple of weeks, we'll be back at it and having fun once again. In two weeks. Thanks so much, Chris. This is fun. Right. I always appreciate speaking with you. As do I. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye.